So welcome everybody. We're so happy that you're here joining us uh, and our master gardeners. Uh, my name's Darby Love and I am an adult services librarian who's just sort of transitioning to temporarily being a library manager in Parksville from Nanaimo. Um, so I'm kind of excited to still have this piece of my job uh, that I carry with me because it's one of my favorites. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I am speaking from the traditional unceded territory of the Stanema and Stananas First Nations, and uh, I see lots of people putting them in the chat. We want to extend our heartfelt thanks to the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association for partnering with Burl on this program, and a special thanks to Joanne Canning for getting it going, and a huge thank you to Richard Bernier, who is shrunk in the grass there, and he's been the... <laughs> team coordinator for all the master gardeners for the last three maybe four years, three um, years. <laughs> it's, so it's that's a, a lot of great work that he's been doing to bring these presentations to you um and we are planning our 2025 season right now as well okay so we're recording the session today but nobody's image or personal information will be captured um the video will be made available after the session uh so if you have to leave or want to look at the information again, want to tell a friend about it, you can do that. Use the chat feature like you are with any uh, questions or comments throughout the presentation. Uh, little questions like what did he say or what's the name of that fertilizer are great for in the chat, um, but the Q&A section on the bottom of your screen is best for bigger questions for Deborah and she will do those after her presentation. Um, Okay, so the people who are going to be monitoring you in the chat are Richard, who started gardening as a preteen, and uh, he got trained by his elderly neighbors for his little job, what, what they thought weeds were in their context and what they weren't, and he's really into tropical plants, <laughs> he's building a house right now, and uh, he moved to the West Coast in 1994. He gets to grow stuff all year long. Yay. Okay. And, and Beth, uh, Beth Walrand, aside from previously being a square dancer. Yay. Yeah. Yay. That's how I first met Beth. She's a certified master gardener and a member of BIMGA, the Association for Master Gardeners. She has over 50 years of experience and her enthusiasm for gardening still remains. She also writes about gardening for Island Farm and Garden Magazine, so you might have seen her name in there. Her small garden has been featured on a number of garden tours, and Beth welcomes visitors to her garden and enjoys showing people around sharing plants and talking about gardening. So those are your qualified help people in the chat. Without further ado, we've got Deborah Garad. She became interested in gardening at an early age from watching her parents, who were both in their 90s and still gardening. Amazing. In 2019, she was able to fulfill her dream of master gardener training and has been a member of BIMGA ever since. Her special interests are pruning. We've got a great um, pruning um, previous session that De Deborah did that you can watch. And um, vegetable gardening is her second special interest. As a retired teacher who still loves to teach, Deborah really enjoys sharing her gardening knowledge with other gardeners like yourselves. Without further ado, Deborah, take it away. Thank you so much, Darby, for that lovely introduction. Um, April, could I ask you, there are some things on my screen. The poll and quiz thing is still up on my screen. And the bar that's supposed to be at the bottom is right in the middle. Is that a a, a me problem or is it just kind of popped up and it and I'd, I'd like I I don't know how to make it go away but we'll it's end the poll but you might have to drag the bar over I, the problem is I can't even wait a second here we go I need to find my nope no no okay could I could I um stop sharing and start sharing again I sure think that might be what I need to do here. Anybody who's ever shared on one of these things will have a lot of empathy for you. <laughs> yes. And if you haven't, it's a very overwhelming experience with one's computer screen. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can move that. All right, move that down. There we go. All right. Great. 
Now we're ready to go. All Perfect. right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'd like to begin by saying it is an honor and a privilege to live in the traditional unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. The Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association is a chapter of the Master Gardeners Association of British Columbia, a registered nonprofit society. We are part of an international organization of specially trained volunteers and consultants who work in partnership with public sector agencies and private enter enterprise to teach and provide us. Uh, oh, my screen is covered up here. I can't even read this. Hang on. Gotta fix it. I hate when technology lets me down. Shoot. Um, I can read it. Yeah, would you read it, Darby? Because I've got I, I've got to figure out how to get. Did you get through the first paragraph? Almost down to the last line. Okay, great. And promotes science-based, sustainable horticultural knowledge and methods. So that's the thing that kind of sets these sessions apart from yes. other things that you might come in contact with. Uh, the seminar is the property of Vancouver Island Regional Library and Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association. It's intended for educational purposes only. Copying under commercial use of all or part of the seminar or its content is prohibited without express written consent from Verl and Vimka. Um, it's science-based and accurate to the best of Gim Bing, sorry, Vimga's knowledge. Use of the information in this seminar is at your discretion, responsibility, and liability. And some images and info are from internet sources. These are labeled and cited, and we thank the persons and companies for their use in this nonprofit seminar. Okay. Thank you, Darby. That was very helpful. <laughs> okay. The health and vigor of plants, trees, and shrubs are governed by a lot of factors, one of the less visible but very important being the roots. Therefore, the ultimate success of a newly planted shrub or tree is heavily dependent on it being properly planted in the first place. Some of the things that gardeners were taught about planting have been proven through research to be not helpful or even downright harmful to plants. So here's a list of things we were taught to do when planting. My talk tonight is going to be about showing you the negative effects of all these and teaching you a much better way. First of all, we were taught to dig a hole twice the size of the root ball, okay? We don't do that anymore. We were taught to, it's okay to leave the burlap and the twine on a, ba a bald and burlap uh, tree. Um, we have discovered through, they've discovered through research that it, the roots have a really hard time getting through that. Sometimes the burlap will degrade, sometimes it won't. Uh, it just depends on um, what kind of burlap it is. And I'm going to show you some pictures later that are uh, pretty interesting. We were taught to just plop the root ball into the hole, right? And then backfill around it. Okay. We discovered that that's not the best way to do it either. We were also taught to amend the soil. Like if your native soil isn't very good, then we add compost, maybe sand, maybe uh, um, uh, uh, manure, composted manure, something like that to improve the texture of the soil. We're gonna talk later about why we don't do that as well. We were taught that fertilizing after you transplant is a good idea. This has been shown to mostly be an effective but there can be times when it actually is a stressor for the plant. So we don't fertilize right after planting usually anymore. <clears throat> we were also taught to stake. Stake it up high, stake it tight so the tree is really solid and being held there in the ground. The problem with that is that the tree needs to have some play in the trunk. So when the wind blows it, it's like exercising a muscle that it makes the trunk stronger and it also helps the tree to get more firmly established, mm -hmm. the root ball more firmly established in the ground. So if you're gonna stake, it's okay to stake high as long as it's loose and you've got some play. Better yet to stake low, like about a foot above the ground and still have a little bit of uh, play in the staking. Also only stake for one year, don't, don't leave it longer than that. And the last thing is we were taught to prune right after planting. And this was about the, the idea being 
if you're going to cut off any of the roots, if you're going to compromise the roots in any way, you need to prune the top to balance, uh, to balance what you did to the roots. And what research has figured out is that in order to establish roots, when you plant something new, the tree or the shrub needs all the food it can get to make new roots. Well, it's the leaves up in the canopy that's the food factory. And that's where all of the food is going to come from to make new roots. So if you prune the top, you're getting rid of a lot of the food source for the plant. And that's going to be really hard on it. So what are the effects of improper planting on trees and shrubs? What are the effects of doing some of these things that we used to do that we no longer do or we shouldn't be doing? Okay, let's look at some uh, pictures of twine and burlap left on. Okay, this is pretty dramatic right here. This is a fairly large tree, but down at the bottom, you can still see the big root ball. It was probably packed in clay still has the burlap on it and it still has the twine. And this, these roots failed and this tree fell over because the, the tree did not establish in the ground because they, the roots could not get out of the burlap. The other problem with that is that if that's a ball of clay around those roots, if that clay dries out, it is extremely hard to re-wet it. So between a dried ball of clay around the roots plus burlap and twine, this poor tree didn't have a chance to establish roots around the, the root ball. <clears throat> and here's another picture. This one was quite uh, alarming, I thought. This twine was left on. Now, what you see, the white stuff you see below the twine, this is where the roots that the tree did develop kind of just broke off and the tree fell over. But you can see how the twine just choked that tree and how the poor tree tried to compensate. But eventually the, the twine just choked the tree out and it, it uh, the roots failed and it fell over. So this is why we take twine and burlap off. Also, if there's ever a wire cage on the, um, the bald and burlap, you should take that off as well. Now, another issue is planting too deep. And um, this is probably the biggest issue with most plantings that people do from a pot. So let's look at some of the effects. The first thing you'll notice when something's planted too deep is the top is going to start dying back. And this happens because of uh, you, you, don't, you can't get enough water uptake through the roots because it's it's uh, everything is too deep and the roots are suffering. And then here's a picture of a tree that was planted too deep and then the, the extra dirt was dug away and you can see it was quite a bit too deep there. But you see how the bark has been rotting? When the bark is in wet soil for a long time, it, it will eventually rot like this and that will kill the tree. Another thing that happens when a tree is planted too deeply is something called adventitious roots. Now, those are roots that sprout out of the trunk of the tree rather than from down in the root zone. And what they're doing is trying to desperately to make roots near the soil surface because the tree or the shrub needs those roots at the surface in order to have good air and water exchange. And if it's planted too deeply, then the tree is gonna sprout these roots on the trunk to try to make itself a new set of roots at the soil surface. And the last one, this, is, this has become fashionable. I even, I even see there's a park in Courtney that all the trees have mulch volcanoes around them. And I, I keep having visions of going down to the city hall offices and see if I could talk to somebody about this. Mulch in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But when you pile it a couple feet high and you've got it packed up against the trunk of a tree, it's going to hold moisture in. And actually, as, this, as the mulch decomposes and turns to soil between that and holding the mulch, moisture in, it's going to rot the trunk or the bark, and then it's going to kill the tree. So just please say no to mulch volcanoes. They're very, very damaging to trees. Another issue is girdling roots. Now, all of these pictures, you can see, it was pretty obvious that these plants were taken right out of the nursery pot and just plopped into the ground. And the roots that were circling and growing in the shape of the pot kept circling in the ground. If the roots are circling in the pot, 
even if you make that planting hole twice as big, the roots are not going to grow outward. They're going to keep circling. And those circling roots keep getting bigger and thicker. And the picture down in the bottom right hand corner, you can see that tree is pretty old. And that one big root going across the bottom, that is now big enough and tight enough, it's starting to choke the tree and it is going to kill the tree unless something's done about that. It might even be too late, I don't know. But this is what happens when you just plop the, uh, the pot into the ground. Okay, and then here I've got a couple of really interesting pictures about roots failing to establish, which is what happens if it's planted too deeply, if you just plop it in the ground and the roots are circling, that this tree blew over and the um, dialogue that was with this on the website, I found this, University of Florida, it said that that side of the tree where you can see the roots exposed on the ground, it basically, no roots had grown out of the root ball into the surrounding soil. So even though the top of the tree looked healthy, it just took wind to come along and blow that tree over because there were not enough roots developed because it was poorly planted. So it just fell over. There weren't enough roots to support it. And this one I think is quite stark. This, uh, this picture from the Missouri Botanical Garden, this shows several um, girdling and swooping around roots. And you can see how it just never really established the soil either. And then this tree fell over. And those roots there, uh, the big one at the front and the little one on the left, they just broke off because the, it's, the trunk is fairly big. So it probably at the top of that tree was fairly heavy. Now here's a picture <clears throat> showing all planting medium removed and it reveals multiple problems. Now the first thing, let's go from the top down, that top red line, horizontal red line, that's the actual planting depth that the, the this plant was in the pot. So you can see how much too deep it was in the pot because the other horizontal red line farther down, that's the correct planting depth. Now the correct planting depth can be found by finding the root flare, which is just what it sounds like. The, the trunk comes down like this and the, where the roots flare out like this, that's the level where the thing should be planted in the ground. So you can see here how much too deep this was in the pot. And then above that planting depth, you can see the adventitious roots growing out of that trunk where that poor little plant was trying desperately to create some roots to get up to ground level for oxygen exchange. And then you can see several roots on here that are going to be girdling roots if you just planted it the way it is. They're twisting and turning and looping. And if you plant it with all those roots just like that, they'll continue to grow in that shape and eventually they will just uh, crowd the plant right out. So tonight I'm going to show you a method for, uh, for transplanting tree shrubs and woody perennials that takes into account the way these plants naturally grow and gives them their best chance of thriving in your garden. We will be looking particularly at plants that have spent all or most of their lives in nursery pots and had their root systems constricted by the size and shape of the pot. Research has shown that root washing is the method most appropriate and successful for transplanting these trees, shrubs, and woody perennials, as well as trees that have been bald and burlapped and plants that were poorly planted in the first place and need to be dug up and replanted properly. It is not useful for annuals, grasses, or plants like rhododendrons that have a, a mass of fine roots rather than a system of larger, more woody roots. The following videos were taken in October of 2023 showing the process of root washing, correcting any malformed roots, and proper planting. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am here today in Mark Fleming's garden in Comox, and we're going to do some root washing and proper planting of uh, several things that he has in pots. Uh, we're going to start. I'm just going to let you know the, the tools that I use. Uh, I have pruners because uh, sometimes you need to correct the roots and you need to prune out roots that are uh, going the wrong direction and are going to cause a problem for the plant later. A root hook is an amazing little tool to help untangle because the first thing we're going to do is wash all the planting medium off of these plants that are in pots. 
and we need to untangle all the roots. So the root hook is really, really helpful for that. Another tool that's necessary is a hose with a nozzle on it that has a jet setting. You don't want one that's gonna spray so hard, it'll take the paint off your house, but it does need to be more than a trickle to actually wash the planting medium off the root ball. Then I like to do this in a wheelbarrow, mostly because uh, the bending over, if it's on the ground, will kill you back. This will also kill you back just more slowly. Okay, so here's a plant. This is a forsythia, which some people call forsythia, depending on where you're from. So we're gonna pop it out of the pot. And if you see the roots at the bottom, it's been circling there, the bottom of the pot. And what we want these roots to be, I mean, if I just planted this in the, in the ground the way it is, these roots would continue to do this kind of circling. They wouldn't necessarily grow out into the soil, which is what we want. So we're gonna wash all the planting medium off of this uh, root ball. Sometimes I get down into the into the water, loosen it up a little bit. Now, and this is a fairly small plant, so this isn't going to take very long. Sometimes with a large plant, it can take a little while to do this. And particularly if the um, uh, if the roots are really, really bound up tight and it's hard to get the planted medium off. So I gently tease these apart. See, I freed that one. So I'm just gonna keep working this, working this, freeing these roots, untangling. See that, that one came loose. What's yes. the best time to do uh, root pruning and do this type of work? The best time is when the plant is dormant. So now is a good time uh, or in the fall, uh, any time that the plant is dormant. Fall is my favorite time because once you've planted it back in the ground, you've got the rest of the, of the winter for the roots to kind of establish and start uh, growing. And then when spring comes and it, the plant leaves out, then uh, it'll make lots more food from leafing out with photosynthesis, and there'll be more food then available for the continuation of the roots uh, continuing to uh, grow. Um, you can do it any time of year, but if you do it when the plant is actively growing or when the weather's hot, hot sun, it's a pretty stressful process. Um, I successfully root wash and planted um, a variegated Norway maple that was about 15 feet tall, 12 feet maybe. And I did it in August because we were going away. It was already suffering in the pot. There was no way I was going to, any of my people taking care of my cats were going to be able to keep that tree alive. So I went ahead and root washed it and planted it. And it immediately dropped a bunch of leaves. The rest of them kind of turned brown on the edges. But I mulched it well, uh, and then I kept it watered for a whole year, did it prune, and it's beautiful now. It, it's, it, it came back beautifully. And it, root washing, it, it, isn't the soil too cold this time of year? Not if you do it before you, the soil is frozen, no. Okay. No, you, you can't do it in frozen soil. We don't usually have that problem here with soil freezing. Uh, some places you would. Um, so the interior? Yeah. The prairies. So can I get somebody to come kind of hold this for me? Because I, I need both of my hands here. But I think we're pretty close to having this all untangled, a little bit more at the top. But look how long some of those roots are. Because they were all coiled at the bottom of the pot. And the thing to remember is, if you plant it like that with the roots all coiled, they will continue to grow coiled. And eventually, uh, they kind of choke out the plant. So the plant just is much happier, better growth if you can spread the roots out. If you think about plants in nature, 
a seedling in the forest, for instance, when it sprouts, it goes down like this and the roots immediately do this. They don't go down, they don't circle. So we're trying to replicate that. We're gonna put these roots back into that um, pattern of out like this, spread out like the spokes of a wheel. <clears throat> now, the next thing I'm looking for is roots that are doing what I call the deranged ones that are going in the wrong direction. See how this one's coming down and then it's bending back toward the middle? Now, if I can spread that out, if I can spread that out like this and bury it to get this going straight, it's going to be fine, which I think I'll be able to because it's not really big and it's not really, really stiff. But if it were a bigger root and it was lignified and really stiff, I wouldn't be able to do that. Then I would cut it off right there. Now, don't be too worried either about pruning some of the roots off. Um, I have cut away as much as half to two thirds of the roots in this process and have the plant bounce back fine. So would you also cut uh, some of the top growth off? Nope. Oh, the, to compensate the, for the loss of roots? No, and here's why. Because in the spring, I want as many leaves as I can get to photosynthesize and make food to grow more roots. And we used to think that if you're cutting roots off, you cut the top to balance. But the, the top is the food factory, so you don't want to cut that off. In fact, any plant that you do this with, that you root wash, correct the roots and plant, you don't want to prune for a year. You want to let it settle in, grow new roots, lots of leaves to feed those new roots, and then a year later, if it needs to be pruning, if it needs to be pruned, then you can prune it. But you should not cut the top off. You're, you're depriving the plant of a food source when you do that, and you're slowing down the, the growth of the new roots. And I'm just as guilty as everybody else. I used to think that that's what we were taught. You know, if you cut roots off, then you balance by cutting off the top. Kind of see where the where the marks are on here, where the staining is on the stems on the trunk. This was planted in the pot just a little bit too deep. You want the uh, right where these branches are coming out of that root ball. You want that to be right at soil level. The problem if you plant something too deep is you're, you're suffocating all those roots at the surface that are critical for oxygen exchange. They need to be close to the surface area, all that. And if you bury it too deep, then you're, you're, the, the plant will suffocate. And it, and, it, and it will die eventually if it's deep enough, too deep enough, kind of a slow death. So we're gonna plant this right at this level right here. With a cane grower like this, which is a cane grower is a plant that all the buds for the new branches are down in the root ball and they get sent up like this. You don't have a trunk with branches on it, with buds and branches. With a cane grower, sometimes it's a little harder to see where that level is, but this is pretty obvious. I've got these two coming out. So the root, the soil level is gonna be right there, just like that. Even though, even though it sort of looks like some of those roots will be above the above that little crown, is that is that a function of that it was too deep in the first place? Yes. Ah, good question. What happens if it's when it's planted too deeply and it stays in the ground? The plant tries to compensate for that uh, oxygen exchange that it's now missing by sending roots out from the trunk that's been buried or from the other roots here, little roots to go up to the surface. Those are called adventitious roots. And that's a sure sign that your, your plant is too deep because it's struggling to get up to the level where it can get oxygen exchange. So if you look closely here on the trunk, you can see tiny little adventitious roots. See the tiny, tiny little roots on there? So if, when you plant correctly, those adventitious roots, they'll just die back and that'll I, be okay? I usually just cut them off. Oh, okay. Yeah, these ones are really tiny. I can just scrape them off with my with my fingers. Oh. But uh, yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wash just a little bit more around this top. Make sure I've, okay. I'm seeing. Move all the planting media for two reasons. Uh, first of all, we wanna be able to see the roots really clearly so that if there's problem ones, we can cut them off. 
and also so we can spread them out like a spokes of a wheel when we plant. <clears throat> but we also want the plant to have uh, just one type of medium that it's growing in. So we don't amend the soil. We don't add anything to it. No compost, no uh, amendments of any kind, no fertilizer. We're going to plant this plant right in the native soil into which it is going to be growing. Because if you have a pocket of soil that's native soil and it's got amendments mixed in with it, then some plants will, they will stay in that little pocket. They won't actually spread out from it. So you need to put it in the same environment it's going to grow. So, so what just, are you saying then if, if say I have generally poor soil, I need to improve that soil well in advance so the whole area is uh, in better condition? Um, and to what depth? Well, okay, let's ask this, answer this question first. To improve the soil, yes, although even if your soil is poor, what you can do is just arborist wood, wood chip mulch up to about four inches after you've planted and your soil microorganisms come up from underneath and they decompose the, the chip, wood chips from the bottom and feed the soil. And over time, it will improve your soil dramatically. Now, if you want to do that ahead of time before you plant, put a big layer of chips on for a year, then pull them back and do the planting and then put the chips back. If, if you're like me and you're a little impatient, I would probably just go ahead and plant it in the poor soil. But it needs time to get established before you do any fertilizing. So, because that can kind of stress the plant. So, okay. arborous mulch is what? Okay. If you've seen guys, uh, companies out cutting down trees or trimming trees or whatever, and they've got the big chipper at the back that makes chips and throws them into the back of the big truck, those are arborous wood chips. And what it is is branches leaves, needles, all of that, all chipped up coarsely, not fine like sawdust, but coarse. That is the, and research has proven this, that is the very best mulch you can use on your garden, on your plants. It mimics what happens in the wild. You know, branches fall, leaves fall, and you've got this nice mulch on the, on the surface. So then in autumn, I, I could just clean up my trees and throw it down on the ground and let that sit over winter to help improve the soil? You absolutely could, yeah. Okay. It'll work faster if you chop it up a bit. But like I, my, my husband bought a chipper for me, thinking, oh, great, a chipper. The problem with this chipper, because you either spend $150 or you spend $2,000, is that it chips up too small. It, and and you make if if things are too small, then what you've got is a layer of stuff that blocks air and water from getting to the soil. So you have to be careful about that. So you want it porous. You want a, you want it porous. And arborist wood chips allow oxygen exchange. They allow water. They moderate the soil temperature. Keeps it warmer in the winter. Keeps it cooler in the summer. Keeps uh, uh, evaporation from the summer. Keeps your soil moist. Keeps the pounding rain in the winter from from uh, destroying your soil texture and suppresses weeds, does all of that. It's magic. So I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, what if you're planting in hard pan? You would have to amend the soil. You'd have to uh, do raised beds or something. Yeah, like like uh, in my yard, we built our house six years ago and it was basically subsoil because you know the contractors come in and scoop everything away. <clears throat> so we had a lot of soil topsoil mix brought in and we built beds all the way around. That is now the native soil. And that's what I plant in. And I've mulched with arborist wood chips and it's improving the soil uh, all the time. So if you've got hard pan, yeah, nothing is really going to grow. On it. So you would have to amend well, or raise beds. Yeah, you're not really amending if you're putting a layer. Amending to me is mixing. Digging it in. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Okay, so I think this little guy, yeah, it's going to so block. sawdust. Yeah. yeah. It has to be bigger than that. It's going to yeah. block air and water from getting down through the surface. So sawdust is, is not a good mulch at all. And now I know a lot of people use um, bark, bark mulch. And it's, bark mulch is, is uh, it's good because it's, it's cheap and it's readily available. But it's not the best mulch because I think of bark mulch as uh, fast food for your plants. Bark, first of all, is hydrophobic, which means 
on the tree itself, it repels water. So bark mulch is going to repel water. So if your mulch ever dries out in your hot summer, boy, you're gonna have a devil time getting it wet again, which can be really a problem. But the other issue is bark is not as um, full of plant nutrients or good stuff for the soil microbiome to feed on. So it's, uh, it, it doesn't really feed the soil very much. It's like fast food. It's better than no mulch because it's protecting your soil and it's moderating temperature and all that stuff. And if that's all you can get, it's better than nothing. But arborist wood chips are the best. They're the gold standard. So, okay. So we're ready to put this in the ground. See how all the, I think this one that with the funny bend in it, we're going to be able to straighten out. So I'm not going to cut it off. Here's another one with a funny bend going the wrong way, but I think I'll be able to straighten that out. Because remember, I want to straighten them all out like the spokes of a wheel. And I think we're going to be able to do that just fine. Because it's a young plant and these roots aren't uh, completely lignified yet. Okay. There's not much here. And the roots are going to spread out this way. So I need the mound. need a bigger hole. Like that. But yeah, see how these roots, how long they are? They're way longer than I anticipated. So we're going to have to extend the size of this hole. Now, not very really deeply. It you, just needs to come down a few inches all, all the way around. Spiral those longer roots? No. If you're spiraling them, then you're causing the same problem it had in the pot. Because if you spiral them, they're going to grow that way. Now, could I could I uh, kind of cheat and just make yeah. yes. it bigger just where I've got longer roots and yes. leave this here? Absolutely. Like it is? Absolutely. Um, okay, first, first thing I'd like to do, though, is, if, Mark, if you could get a, a, some kind of a little stake. Because this is not going to stand on its own once I start fiddling with everything. We could just stake it for now to hold it up. Then we can start, we can start digging little trenches for these roots. I mean, it, it might be easier to just kind of take the shovel and scoop a layer. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's plenty. So you just want to stabilize it while you're planting it so it doesn't fall over. Right, because I only have two hands. <laughs> what? What? Whoa. You're a mess. You're a gardener. You should have three. I should have three, yeah. One trains one's toes. <laughs> Sometimes you, you go like We're that. All and you aren't we? fall right over and you absolutely need a steak. This one might have been okay. All right, so... I need to see where these roots are going to go. This side looks not too bad. Okay, so I'm going to lay the roots out. I just want them to go straight like the spokes of a wheel. This side looks pretty good. So here, lay that on there to kind of hold it. And turn down like that. Okay, now the next step is just to fill in the soil a third to a half. Fill in the hole about a third to a half all the way around. So, so Mark was saying that you're going to have a you're going to have a, a path over here and here. So then that sharp edge is uh, will kind of stop the roots from growing into the path. No, no, not really. It's just going to oh. be mulched. It's okay. going to be mulched. Oh, no. okay. No. Okay. Um, but but the but it, they will be encouraged to grow back. Well, the, in they've the got a good yeah. start going this way yeah. and that way. Um, and if there's a lot of traffic on this spot. Yeah. The roots would kind of get discouraged anyway because the soil will get compacted. Uh, but this is a forsythia and it's going to get pretty big. 
So I, I would guess you're going to be walking out here. Oh, which okay. means the roots have some so place space to go. Will be in line today. Yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I yeah. think it'll be fine. So you're allowing for for the future. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. This yeah. is a, this is something to do. And so All right, now I put about that much in. Let me get the hose. So you're washing the soil into the uh, the roots and so the knob. Okay, so this is called mudding in because remember we put all these roots and they're bare. There was no planting medium, so we have to wash the soil down around all those roots and cover them up because you don't want any air pockets. And often when you do this, you re-expose roots. See here at the top, the roots are kind of poking through again. But I'm not done, I'm just starting. So we'll do that. There. And then another layer of soil. And for a small plant like this, you probably only have to do, do this twice. A bigger one, you might have to do it three times. But what you're going to do is, is do it enough times so the level of the soil is where you want it. And so the, the root flare here, where the plant is coming out, is slightly above or right at soil level. You don't want to bury it too deep. So right now, it looks like I'm burying it a little deep, but I'm going to mud it in again. So it's going to uh, settle. Okay. Okay. So that shows uh, root washing the forsythia. And here is a, per a picture of that plant 10 months later after uh, it had had a whole summer, spring, or fall, winter, and spring, and then into summer to grow and leaf out. So the next video that I'm going to show you is a Saskatoon berry, <clears throat> which had a surprise for us all when all the planting medium was washed off and the roots were corrected. Ooh. Oh, no, that one's not too bad. This one has not been... Uh... It's a nice fat worm. This one is going to go fairly quickly because those roots are, um, remember how the other one, they were all wrapped around? This is much better. Okay. So just go straight, straight up. <laughs> what kind of plant is that? Saskatoon berry. It is very Saskatoon. Yeah, this is going to wash right off. Okay, so that was planted too deep in the pot and it's got adventitious roots. But look at this root that comes up and does this and back down again. That's going to have to come off because that's very lignified. So the, these roots that are much more of a net, it brings to mind rhododendrons. Rhododendron roots are just a big net. So if you tried to do a, a full root washing and remove all the planting media, you would probably kill the plant. And I'm speaking from experience because I did that once. That's the only thing I've ever killed root washing was a rhododendron. So what I do with a rhododendron is I generally just wash the surface to find the root flare to make sure I'm planting it at the right depth. And then with the pot, if it looks like it's been in there a long time and it's just a massive net, then I just kind of score the roots along like this and plant it. Root washing, it's just not gonna work with a rhododendron. 
So are there certain types of plants that it works better for? That's a very good question. Uh, trees, shrubs, woody perennials, uh, don't do uh, annual snow, anything that's that's um, been growing for a while and is going to continue to grow. Uh, <clears throat> I want to talk while I'm while we're looking at this plant too about how how they end up planted too deeply when you buy them at the nursery because you think well aren't they paying attention well here's the thing they are paying attention but if visualize starting with a tiny seedling you know usually a little plug or a little pot and then they pot it up into something a little bigger and if they put you know a half a centimeter too much soil and then they pot it up again bigger another half a centimeter maybe it's a centimeter this time by the time it's been potted up, if it's a good-sized tree into something this big, it can be very much too deep. And this is more a function of uh, the sort of the production that nurseries do. They're into production, making lots and lots of plants. And to take the time to look at every one, where is the root flare, they really don't have time to do that. So that's why the home gardener needs to look carefully, find out where the root flare is. Okay, so let's look at this guy. You see the stains up here? You can see how deeply this was planted. And the root flare is down here. This is a Saskatoon berry. And again, it's it's a cane grower. So the, the buds are all down in the bottom and these canes all came up from down there. See this, these roots here? Those are adventitious. Adventitious, yeah. They, this has been too deep long enough for these little roots to grow, trying to make some roots at the surface for air exchange, okay? You've got all these little stems here that are coming up. This one was coming up and then it went right straight back down into the ground, which is weird. Uh, we've even got an adventitious root up here. Look at the ones here, because you can see where the soil was. It was clear up here when it should be down here. It was trying to produce new canes. Well, it this is root. It's trying to produce roots because to get roots at the surface of the soil. Even though that stuff is, is green in there? I'm talking about this piece right Oh, now. that piece. That oh, I piece see. right there. Right, right. Yeah, these are new canes it's trying to produce. Um, but yeah, we've got a lot of adventitious roots there that we're going to have to do some so more about. You could propagate those if you wanted to. You could sure. cut it off right about there and then propagate that as a fresh plant. Sure, that's a whole nother presentation, but you're right. <laughs> We're not Just gonna get into that. that in. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, I'm gonna take a minute here and get the rest of the planting medium off this. Uh, you don't need to, maybe I'm sorry, all off of here. And now we can see what the problems are with the roots. First of all, here's the root flare right here. Here's the, the soil where it should have been planted right here. And you see the stains all the way up, how deeply this was planted, how too deep this was planted. And because it was planted too deep, see this root right here is actually coming out of the trunk. That's an adventitious root. And we're going to cut that right off. That's that poor thing trying to compensate for being too deep and creating some roots at the surface. Here's another one that's coming right out of the trunk. I'm gonna cut that one off. Now I've got little sprouts here that are weak and I'm gonna sort of trim that one off. All right, so first thing always is I check for adventitious roots. All right, see there's one, see that one right there? That is coming out of a spot along with little branches and a root because it was buried underneath the soil. So I'm just going to take that whole thing right off like that. Now you created a wound there. Is that a problem uh, or will it heal over because it's in the air? Yeah, it's going to be in the air. Uh, pruning is wounding. They don't really heal. They seal. And this one will probably be okay. Uh, service berry, Saskatoon berry is a pretty vigorous plant. It's native. It should be fine. Yeah, I don't, I don't anticipate. So all the, all the, the uh, microbes and stuff in the soil aren't, aren't. This is going to hurt it. This yeah. is going to be up in the air. Uh, in See, the we're going to soil level is going to be right there. Oh, okay. 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 Now here's here's another adventitious root right there. 
And there's another one. I mean, they're they're just this has been too deep for a while. Been in the pot a while. Look at this one right here at the back. Yeah. Okay, that one right around this side. Oops, here's one here. See that one right there? Growing up out of the trunk, it shouldn't. Here's another one, like that. Okay, so I think we've got most of the adventitious roots. So now let's look at the rest of the roots. <clears throat> Remember our goal is to spread the roots out like the spokes of a wheel. So I have ones here that I can do that with. That one's gonna be fine. That one's gonna be fine. But look at this guy here. Look at this big curly whoop, whoop, whoop around and down all curled up. What's gonna happen if you leave that there? As this plant grows, that root is gonna get bigger and bigger and thicker. And if eventually it could actually choke this uh, shrub out a tree is because this will be a small tree like thing. So anything that looks like that, that's got to come out of there because that is going to cause problems down the road. So I'm going to take it right there and remove it. Okay, now see what's left. I've got all these nice roots that I can spread right out. Would you take that one out? It... That one looks dead to me. Yeah. And it's coming from branch. Yeah, I think it's dead. So I'm gonna just, yeah, that one's dead. Yeah, okay. But now I've got all of these that are gonna spread out nicely. But look at this one. It comes around and up and around again. But even if you go all the way back here, it's come from down here and underneath and all the way back to there. This is just a great big spiral is what that is. So if I'm not sure how far to go back, I'll do it in stages just to make sure. I know this big loop here needs to come out. So let's take that loop out, throw it out of the way. Oh, look at this. Mark, two plants. Two. It was two. Look at that. You didn't cut anything. No, no. no. It she was just two took plants. out an old root. It was, was it, it was two plants. That they do that often if they're small, they'll put two in a pot. I've had that. I bought a, a few uh, azalea last summer and it had five little plants in it. Oh, yeah. Which is like bonus. <laughs> yeah. Now, see this root that comes straight down and then loops back up again. That's gonna be a problem because this is gonna continue, this is gonna to continue to get bigger and fatter mm -hmm. and choke itself out. It's so not, it's, not major root, right? it's a major root. But here's the thing. Again, this is a native plant. It's pretty hardy. We've got this over here. So, and where, there were two in the pot. So if this one doesn't survive, he's got another one. <laughs> yeah, so we need to take that off. Anything going straight down, anything looping, anything in a J hook or an elbow, because remember, we wanna be able to spread the roots like the spokes of a wheel. Now we could do that, except this is coming down and looping back up on wow. itself. So I'm just gonna- to Take just, it right at the deepest uh, part of that? I'm, or is I'm gonna do it right there. And believe it or not, I think that's gonna be enough for it to survive. Yes. It should. It yeah. should. And then you've got you've got a root starting there. Yep. Right yep. there. So roots will sprout out of this that. this piece yeah. here, but they'll go this way because that's what roots want to do if they're not in a pot. Okay. All right. So that one is ready to plant, I think. So let's look at the other one. We had no idea, by the way, there were two plants in here when we first looked at this. Okay. So same thing. Yeah, see the big loop coming up and around. 
So when these guys were smaller, it looks as if they just took two and just pushed them together. And that mm -hmm. turned the root, yep. turned the exactly, root around yeah, in yeah. a U. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Now again, we've got quite a few roots left. This one almost looks like it was made from a cutting as well, rather than a seedling. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, which means it's hard to see where the root flare is. I'm going to say it's right there. Here, yeah. Which means I have an adventitious root there. And then on the back side, look at the adventitious roots I have back here that need to come off. There and there. And that little guy right there. So if I'm going to plant that here, that's an adventitious root. See, we don't have a lot of root left, but you know what? It might be fine. It might be fine. Well, it's got the winter, the fall and the winter to grow you know, roots. It does. So. It does. That one worries me. See it looping back? If I take that off, I don't have much left, but I'm going to do it anyway. But as you say, it was compromised from the beginning. It was. It yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. So not much there, but there's a little bit. We'll see how it does over the winter. It might be just fine. Again, there was two in the pot, so we're good. Okay. Well, here is an awful lot lower than than this plant here. Um, uh, aren't you going to end up like too high on the on the uh, the stalk there? Or is it just the mulch that's going to be out? Uh, I think this, I've got this right at soil level here. And uh, it's okay to mulch over, to mulch up above. You're going to keep your mulch back in a circle about like that. Um, and and it's it's fine to have your mulch deeper. and and, and uh, Oh, just kind of like in a donut. So as long as as long as I'm not suffocating the soil in here, yeah, but, but if my mulch comes up high. Mulch doesn't suffocate. That's the point. Mulch doesn't suffocate anything. So you could even put the mulch right up to the trunk if you wanted to, and it would be fine. And in fact, there is no credible research that says mulching up to the trunk is a problem. There's a lot of anecdotal stuff, and a lot of people say, oh, you're asking for trouble. There's no research that says it is a problem. So it's just the soil that's the issue. Yes, it's the soil. Because adventitious roots are not going to grow in mulch. And mulch allows water and oxygen exchange. So it's it's not the issue. So as long as the mulch isn't compact, if we put it's mudding it in. Mudding it in. Okay, that's the end of that video of the Saskatoon berry. And here is that same plant 10 months later. You can see how it leafed out nicely, uh, especially at the bottom with those nice new big leaves. I think that shows that it's uh, really establishing well. The last video I have to show you is a small tree that had failed to establish after being in the ground for two years, as evidenced by its root ball rocking back and forth in the ground. Okay. Okay. Here we have a contorted fig. Hazelnut. Hazelnut. Sorry. <laughs> Filbert. Filbert. Whatever. Okay. But what I noticed on this guy is when you wiggle it like this, see how the root ball rocks back and forth? That's an indication that this tree, which has been in the ground for two years, has not seeded itself really well. I'm not too concerned that it's too deep because I can see the root flare right here. What I'm wondering is when it was planted, if the roots are still kind of all in the shape of the pot and they're circling, but we'll find out. We don't know why that is rocking, but that's an indication that it hasn't established well. So we're going to dig it up and have a look. And how long has it been in the ground? Uh, two years, Ruth. Yep. Yeah, two okay. years. Start out around it like this to kind of get the feel for where the root ball is.
Okay, pull that right out of there. It's still attached. Okay, so what we're going to do, we ultimately want to get all the soil off of this root ball, but if I can put a lot of it right back here right now, that will be helpful. So I have it to reach on a hole. So this would be its second summer in the ground, so it actually didn't put out too many roots no. past the pot. Something going on. So we'll wash all that rooting medium off, and we'll figure out what it was. We've, we've mostly got this cleaned off, and we can see right here this root coming down and across. And this one is coming like that and heading that direction. And then we got these two little guys that are coming out and then do this 90 degree elbow turn and then heading out this way. So we need to get rid of these guys. Now, one of the things when I teach pruning is that one of the kinds of branches that you prune out are deranged, grown in the wrong direction. And I think of these as roots that are deranged. Now this one, these two that are doing this and out, if I cut them right there, then they're gonna be going the right direction. So I'm just gonna cut them off like that. Like that, okay? And this guy right here, see him looping back around? We don't like him to loop back around. That causes problems. And then I still want to tease those apart a little bit. What I'm trying to do, remember, is to all the roots to be able to spread them out like the spokes of a wheel. And anything that won't do that has got to go. So can we turn that off? Okay, now this one concerns me. Not only is it turning back, it's kind of going up a bit. Um, it's the, it's the growing up, I think. There's not a lot on there. I'm going to cut that one back right there, because that was growing in the wrong direction. Okay, the rest of these look pretty good. See how we can spread them all out. Okay, good. Let's do a little bit more. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now, if I've got little bits and pieces in here that I've cut off, it doesn't matter. They'll decompose and feed the soil. We can just leave them in there. Oh, look what I just found here. I just felt that. Look at this one. It's coming out and then bending this way. Okay. All right, now let's look at it from the top. See, those all look... Okay, now this guy right here is the one that is one that worries me. This is the one that is coming out up above where I think the root flare should be. It's heading straight down. Can you hold that for a sec? It's heading straight down here like that. And then where is it going? That's the one, is that the one we cut off going sideways? Yeah, I don't know. I think I think that's the best. If this were coming straight out this way, it wouldn't be so bad. Straight down though, that that's just not good. Plus, see the piece here; it's ducking under and going that way. Yeah. That's so we're we're going to take that guy off. Okay. Well, let's see if we can pull it out of there so we can see. what it was doing.
Wow. It yeah. was really coming yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. This was continuing on down straight. And then this side was also going down straight. Both of which are not good. Now, when I look at it, now we can really see the trunk. So as I look at this trunk, here's the graft up here, right under Ruth's feeders. This looks to me like it was a cutting because we've got roots coming out kind of down here, here, all the way around. And that's what happens when you root a cutting is there's no obvious root flare like they are with a seedling. So you have to just kind of make a executive decision. You know, what am I going to choose to be my root flare? Well, you don't have many roots down here. You've got some. Uh, these are a little bit sparse. These are where the main roots are. So we're going to choose this up here to be to be your root flare. Our root flare is right here. I think it was probably planted about like that. It wasn't too awfully deep. Um, but we're going to replant it. Here's another thing. When you have a a tree that has with that the rootstock was cutting, you have a, a straight down piece where often after we do root washing, we just have roots coming out like a wheel and you're going to set it on a mound in the hole. But this has this straight down piece. So we, we, we uh, don't have a mound in the hole. Okay, so that's the end of that one. Now, although root washing and proper planting after root washing and proper planting, plants should leaf out and grow a bit the first year, but be patient. Remember this little mantra for new plantings. The first year they sleep, the second year they creep, the third year they leap. Although I have had plants that I've root washed skip the sleep year and go straight to creeping, and then by the second year, they are leaping and flourishing. So here are some resources if you'd like more information. Um, I suggest you take a screenshot of this page if you're interested in checking these out. The myth of fragile roots might be very reassuring for those of you who are still worried about getting in there and messing around with the roots. What is root washing? It's just a write-up about how it all works. And the one secret hack that will save you time and money by Dr. Linda Chalker Scott is just a short little paper on the wiggle test to see if a plant that you've planted has established itself in the soil. Okay, thank you very much for listening. And now let's have some questions. Thanks, Deborah. I stuck the uh, direct YouTube link for your above ground pruning talk from last year um, for those who are looking for it as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. So uh, question one, does the washing damage the root hairs and fine roots? Um, it does not really damage them. Each root has a, a growing, the cells that are growing called meristem are right at the very tip. And what's going to happen, there are also all along the roots, there are little epicormic buds that you can't really see, just like there are in the branches and the trunk of, a, of the upper part of the plant. So as soon as you planted it in the ground, all those little buds and all those little bits of meristem that growing tissue, they're gonna kind of wake up and start to make new root hairs and new tiny roots. Um, it, it's a bit of a mysterious process. And I, I admit that it feels scary to get in there and mess around with the roots like that. But I've been doing this now for three years. I've been teaching it and I've only lost one plant and that was a rhododendron that I tried to wash all the rooting medium off and basically took all the roots with it. So it just works. So that sounds like the rooting medium was almost like sticky to the roots. Well, it, it the rooting medium comes off easier with roots that are bigger and a little bit woody. And rhododendron roots are not like that. They're all fine. They're like hair. And they're, they're this big mat and they just get embedded with the rooting medium. And in order to get the rooting medium out, or the planting medium out of there, you end up washing all these little roots away and breaking them off is what you do. It, it just doesn't work. The same with grasses. Grasses have this, this net of, of fine roots. So you don't need to root wash grasses and any annuals. They're not going to have woody roots either. So you don't do those. Uh Great, thank you. Do you mind reversing to the um, slide with the links for 
people? Sure. There they are. Yep. We answered Ellen's question. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have a guest from California. Ooh, they California. said they bought a citrus tree and planted it outside. <laughs> in California, you can do that. In the ground. And now in the fall, all the leaves have dropped off. How can I tell if the tree is dead or do I need to dig it out and check if it was planted incorrectly? Well, let, let's do the wiggle test first. Do that. Get out there and, and do this with the trunk. And if the root ball rocks in the ground, then it's planted too deeply. That's your very first sort of test to see if there's anything wrong. Um, when did the leaves drop off? Did they drop off like for fall? Because, yeah, I think citrus trees. No, they they don't. They keep their leaves. They're keep evergreen. Their leaves. Yeah, they do lose their leaves. Uh, some of the leaves in the fall. Okay. Uh, they lose their leaves every year, basically. But it's the older growth that right, they right. leave. If it's lost all its leaves, then I think they have a problem. Right. Either planted too deep, too much water, or too dry. Or not enough water, yeah. yeah. But do the wiggle test first. That'll tell you if the plant, if it was planted properly. And if, because if it's planted okay, the roots will establish into the soil and make it solid so that when you when you do this with the trunk, it won't, the root ball won't rock in the soil. You're going to have everybody wiggling all the trees that they see. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I did that with all of mine after I learned this. <laughs> after uh, Deborah's pruning seminar, I walked around critiquing everybody's <laughs> pruning, even though I'm not a great pruner. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of knowledge makes a person. Uh, very dangerous. <laughs> Uh, okay. Also from Alice, how can you tell if a tree is dead? I have an Asian pear tree that was purchased as bare root. It has never developed leaves for three years. Is it hopelessly lost? Oh gosh. If it hasn't had leaves for three years, I'd, I'd, be, I'd bet money it's dead. But the way to test if something is dead is you, you scratch a little bit of the bark. And if, if what, if you can find a layer under the scratching that's green, that's the living part of the tissue. And that means it's still alive. But if you scratch and all you get's brown, it's dead. Yeah. It's not yeah. If it hasn't grown leaves in three years, it's a goner. It's a goner. Absolutely. <laughs> um, would you care to comment on bare root trees? Uh, well, the, the thing about bare root trees is, is um, they've already, there's no planting medium on them. So you're basically going to plant them the same method that I showed you here, Spo the, 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 to put the roots out like the spokes of a wheel, plant them at uh, the root flare right at ground level. You're going to do all of that. Depending on where they came from before they were bare rooted, you may have some root correcting to do. There may be some girdling roots. There may be some other things that need to be taken care of depending on how they were grown. But it, the only difference is you just don't have to wash the rooting me or the planting medium off because there isn't any. So you've saved that step. Okay. Can I have a follow-up question? Okay. Last time I bought a bare root fruit tree, the garden store pruned the top as well. Would you advise, next time I buy a bare root fruit tree, I should ask for them not to do that. Is that correct? Well, okay. No, you should. It shouldn't be cut like that. Nurseries, they've gotten into the this thing about um, pruning trees in pots or even bare root to make them look like what the adult grown up tree is going to look like because that's what the buyer wants. Whereas a young tree is not going to look like that. A young tree is going to have it, its shape isn't going to be developed yet. You're going to be doing some formative pruning to to make it the shape that you want particularly fruit trees. But if you just cut the top off of a tree, uh, if it's a young tree, it's, it, it might uh, not affect it quite so much. But topping a tree is one of the worst things you can do as far as the health of the tree. You've created a wound right in the top that rain's going to get in and rot's going to get down into the trunk. You will, you will do better if you get a young tree that hasn't been topped. And then um, a really good reference material, a reference book, for how to do formative pruning in a, especially fruit trees to make the shape that you want. The Royal Horticultural Society has a book on pruning and training that has amazing pictures and diagrams and explanations 
for shaping young trees for whatever you want, whatever shape you want, whatever size the tree is. And I highly recommend that book. And I know it's available in, in the library, but you can also buy your own copy of it. It comes hardback. It's a big hardback book, or I think you can get a paperback. But it's really good for formative pruning for young trees. Oh, Richard. Well, I have the book it. here, but yes. Yes. it's not working. There, there you go. Yeah, it's a wonderful book. It's just a really wonderful resource for pruning and training for shape for young trees. I think we can find it off of Amazon. And yeah. I think that you have it in the library. I know you do. We probably bought a bunch of pruning books yeah. after we had you. Yay. <laughs> That's a great way to improve our collection. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Robin is asking, can you cut the roots shorter rather than accommodating the length? Well, the, the more roots you can leave, the better, because again, the roots need to establish and the roots are going to be what takes up water and takes up nutrients to help feed the plant. Um, I would not recommend it. I try to save as much of the root mass as possible because it's just going to establish more quickly. So it's just like cutting the top. You're cutting off the food factory. If you cut extra roots off the bottom, you're cutting off the plant's ability to uptake water and nutrients. Okay, so you're, we're making a lot of uh, cost-benefit analysis cuts when we're yes. working on this, aren't we? Exactly, exactly. That's a good way to put it. Okay, Connie is asking, um, you recommended arborist bark mulch. My fruit trees that are pruned by the arborist are very old and despite having some canker produce lots of fruit. I worried about using that wood as mulch so I've never kept it. What are your feelings about using arborist mulch that may contain diseased or unhealthy wood or leaves? It's not a problem because whatever the disease is that that is on the living plant, as soon as that that those branches or the trees or whatever are chipped up, they're no longer living and those those microorganisms are going to die. They're not going to be an issue. And there's, they've actually uh, done some research on this to show that um, the disease is not carried into the chips and then gets back into the trees. So no, you don't have to worry about that. The one thing that, that you do need to be careful about is um, if you have, uh, like my apple tree, I have a, an apple tree that is a variety that gets apple scab. So I have to be really careful about cleaning up the leaves underneath the tree every fall because the apple scab will overwinter in the leaves and then travel back up into the tree. But that's a different issue than the mulch. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Wendy's asking, if you have a rhododendron with fibrous roots, how do you prep them for planting? With what kind of roots? Fibrous. fibrous. Oh, fibrous. fibrous. All, all I do is I I spray the top and try to get the uh, as much of the planting medium away from the top so I can find the root flare because I don't want it too deep. And sometimes you'll find the root flare and then the, the root ball will be kind of mounded up like this. And I find that you've got this big mat of roots that I can kind of even cut some of that away at the top and then plant it at the right level. And it'll it'll be just fine, yeah. The other thing you can do with uh, rhododendrons is they do self root along the stem quite easily. So if you do let the uh, the branches touch touch the soil, you will get free plants from it. It's called yeah. the ground uh, ground layering. Yep, my my mom has been doing that with her rhododendrons for fifty years. She just she takes the branches down low and she lays it on the ground. And, puts a rock on it to hold rock it there. It. Yeah. And then within a year it's rooted and she has a whole new plant. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, comments on use of mycorrhizal fungi applied at time of planting. Do I say not, that? Very, not very useful. No. It really isn't. It sounds great, but they've done research and it shows that it uh, it doesn't transfer well to the soil and, and populate the soil, like the hope is that it would. It's one of those things that isn't very effective and it's kind of a waste of money. There are lots of microized, if your soil is fairly healthy, 
they are mycorrhizae in the soil. Plus, arborist wood chips are even a, even a layer of leaves or straw or something like that. They're going to be organisms in that that are going to get down into the soil and create a lovely, healthy soil microbiome. So I I wouldn't. I mean, I used to buy that stuff and put it on, and and the research has showed it's it doesn't really do anything. So I, I do time. use it in my house plants though. And I find I have better success with uh, the house plants if I use it. Oh, okay. Well, you're looking at um, a small uh, microbiome, right? It's just the pot itself. So right, and it's a bit of an artificial environment too, because you're not outside is. where you're exposed to all the all the the microbes that are out in the in the world, sort of thing. So that's good information. I didn't know that, Richard. Thank you. Great. So Richard's going to cost us money. Deborah's going to save us money with our <laughs> self propagating and. Oh, I did mention about the ground layering. So that'll save you money. Oh, thank you, Richard. You had another point. Okay. Uh, I planted a hydrangea two weeks ago, says Sandra. Is it fine to dig back up? And she wants to do it with the root washing. Uh, it's, wait till it's dormant. Wait till the leaves all fall. I mean, I, I don't know if it'd be dormant quite yet. Okay. You get if, it, if it is, you can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or you could wait. Yeah. Or you could wait till, you could wait till February, March. You could do it then as well. But yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I think all of us here are having some regrets about planting. <laughs> done, possibly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like Frank Sinatra regrets. I've had a few. Oh my mm. gosh. When I learned about this. I went through my yard and thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? And I've dug up things and, and root washed and replanted. And yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Joel had a question some about root washing out of the chat that didn't make it in that I thought was interesting. What about moving a bush that's doing well? Say a blueberry. So he wants to move this blueberry. Would you root wash in that instance? I, I would root wash anything I'm going to move because I want to uh, inspect the roots and get rid of any that are circling or, or particularly if it wasn't root wash when it's originally planted, you may have some circling girdling roots that you need to take care of. So it's a second chance. Just move everything in your whole yard. <laughs> well, it, it also depends on the, the plant itself and yeah. how old the plant is, how long it's been in the pot. If it's just been, you know, planted just shortly, then it should be all right. But if well, it's been I, I for actually, a season or two, then I would definitely. I actually helped a woman. I taught her how to uh, uh, dig up. She had four blueberry plants that were very crowded. She wanted to move two of them. And they had oh, okay. been in the ground for two, three years and had borne lots of fruit, but she needed to move them. So I taught her how to pull them up root wash, correct the roots, and then we replanted them in another spot. And I saw them at the end of that season. We did it in uh, the fall, or I think we did the fall. And then the next summer I saw them and they were doing beautifully. So, yeah. If I could just add, I think one of the uh, things about digging up a plant and having a chance to look at the roots is that it really helps to see what's going on. Uh, not only their root washing, but what bugs are down there? Are, are there any cane borers around? Um, how how deep is the depth of moisture into the area? Now, that's always an interesting thing when you have a chance to dig up a plant. And you and I am always I have been so, so surprised this summer how dry it was. And I thought I was watering well enough with a silver hose and. Uh, when I had to dig up, move some things, it was like, oh my gosh, even after heavy rain, the moisture was only about two inches deep. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for that, Beth. That, and that's a good reminder that another reason to root wash anything, anything you um, get in a pot from a nursery or from anywhere really is you want to make sure you're washing off um, or um, bugs that are in there, larvae or something, you know, root weevils or anything like that. It, it's just a good idea to, yeah, it's a good way to find out what's in there and get it all washed off, start fresh. Yeah. Great. Where can I get a root hook? I bought mine at Lee Valley. 
I ordered it from Lee Valley, but I think any garden center would have one. And they're, you know, they're small, inexpensive, maybe $10. I don't know. I can't remember how much I spent for it. Excellent. But, Very accessible. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Jennifer says, wow, I made some mistakes just this fall planting a small wheat gala as well as Agilia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As well as transplanting a Japanese snowball. Should I go ahead and risk disturbing them again and replant them properly? Um, since you just you just did how long ago was this done? If it was just done in the last few weeks, yeah. You, you could probably go ahead and and do it. Go ahead and dig them up and replant them properly, and then they'll have the whole winter to settle in. Uh, if if you wait until even March, that would be okay as well. Um, I just like to do it in the fall to give them longer to kind of get established. But I've done it in the spring as well. So excellent. I have a few non woody plants I'd like to transplant. Do the same rules still apply? Um, Beth, have you done any non woody plants? I mean, root washed and replanted any non woody things before I chime in on that? Um, I just revamped a whole bed in the front yard, gave away everything, and have saved something. So yes, I have. I've done a lot, and it really depends on what plant it is. Like I, I'm an iris collector, mm. and so with with the irises that I saved, and this was quite a few months ago, I dug them up, trimmed the roots, trimmed the leaves, and healed them into my seedling boxes. And they had enough time to grow a whole new set of roots, really healthy roots. Good. And I'm, once the new, once their bed was redone, I um, I planted them from that seeding box into the new bed. I've done the same thing with the rhubarb. I will root wash all of the soil off the rhubarb and replant it. Rhubarb's quite a loves a really um, humusy, rich soil. So um, I've had really good success with that on rhubarb and some of the herbaceous perennials also. Yep, and I've done I've done Dicentra bleeding heart, the big tall mm -hmm. one. I root washed and planted that, and that plant exploded the first year. Wow. I mean, it went from you know this tall and about this big around to uh, a meter in diameter. It just it was just enormous. Uh, and I've done it to uh, Brunera, Jack Hart. Um, and just because, you know, I, I like to root wash and it's kind of fun. And then I also find out I've got more than one plant in the pot. Yeah. That video that I said, yes. I bought that um, azalea that had five little ones in it. I planted all five of those separate. And you should see them now. They've tripled in size. And this was a year and a half ago I planted them. Wow. Yeah. So... Another cost-saving tip from Deborah. I know, I know. Great times here. Still I know. And you know, there's another plant. That, I don't know if you, how many of you have experience with Daphne. Daphne hate to be moved. They hate to be pruned. They will sulk. They will just be, eh. and I bought. Or they will die. Or they'll just die. Yeah, I bought three of them and they weren't cheap. And I rewashed them and one pot had two. So I ended up with four. And um, they had twisted roots and all this, and I planted them. I did everything the way I was supposed to. It was fall. I mulched them and they sat there for like, no, I think I did it in late winter because they sat there for two months and did nothing. And then they just exploded. They just went boom. And they are now they're all about, um, two feet across, two feet in diameter. And this was like two years and they were all little. So, uh, Daphne Odera? Uh it would eternal fragrance, the variety of eternal fragrance. Right. Yeah. And they're all they're gorgeous. I have four of them when I only paid for three. <laughs> <laughs> um, are raspberries a good candidate for root washing? I've never root washed raspberries because uh, raspberries are so vigorous. In fact, my raspberry patch came under the fence from my neighbor's yard. They they just grow under like this underground rhizome thing, this underground. Uh, 
Richard and, and uh, Beth, have you done anything with raspberries? I brute washed. Okay. Because you yeah. get and then that, and then I can divide at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So. Anything anything that's got a woody stem or that's a perennial or that's going to be in the ground more than just an annual, I I just I root wash it no matter what. Well, uh, cane growers are so easy. Yeah, they are hellebores. I've done hellebores. Uh, yeah. So we have a, a question from Connie Prain about Syrianus. See, Syriacus. Uh, is she talking about ha uh, the hibiscus, the uh, shrub hibiscus? I'm wondering if she could just let yeah, us know. Yeah. yeah. I can't get into the chat. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's actually a cane grower also. So it won't, uh, it'll grow from uh, the trunk or from the bottom of the of the root flare. So it should be fine. All right, she said she uh, turned it right down to the base and that has sprouted from many shoots from the base. What do I do? Choose the, the uh, shoots you want to keep keep them, you know, like evenly spaced around the, what you have left as a trunk and just go from there. And also uh, every year prune out the one or two oldest, biggest canes to keep the young, vigorous ones because they're going to bloom better. And the old ones you should be getting rid of. Once you're, once it's about four or five years old, then start taking those oldest ones out every year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or you can train it into uh, a standard. Yep. Okay, we've got two more questions and it's hey. two after. I think we can do it. Uh, Wendy asks, when do you add bone meal to plants? I don't. You don't? No. The only thing I've ever really done bone meal with is bulbs. Um, I'm going to give yeah. you one more reference and that's the, it, it, it's a group called the Garden Professors who are all horticulturists and scientists who do research on plants and gardening issues. And they really advocate soil testing because you, if, if you are just fertilizing or you're adding bone meal or you're adding whatever, whatever, you're just guessing. And it's really easy to over fertilize. And one of the things we tend to over fertilize with where we live in this area is phosphorus um, because there is phosphorus in our soil. Plants don't use a lot of it. But any fertilizer that's a complete fertilizer always has phosphorus. So you're always adding more. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really affect the plants that you're growing. But when there's too much in the soil, it leaches through and it washes down and it gets in our waterways and it ends up in rivers, lakes and the ocean. And it's not good for the ecosystem. So a soil test will tell you the levels of everything you have in your soil and uh, then you can know what you should be fertilizing with what you and and more often than not, you really don't need much. The one fertilizer that is very volatile in the soil that you really can't test for is nitrogen. And that's the one that everything needs. So if you if you if everything else in your soil is OK, then you want to get an all nitrogen, just nitrogen fertilizer rather than one of the the. Um, complete fertilizers that has everything in it. So that's why I don't, I don't use bone meal. It, okay. it seems superfluous, but if it you does. use it and have good results, then go for it. It does yeah. take a long time to break down in the soil. And that, that's what I think one of the issues is that it's not readily available to begin with anyway. So you're putting all this in there where the roots can't use it yeah it doesn't uh, go into solution very well okay wendy said thank you last question from Lori: if you're planning on growing a tree in a pot and wanting to keep it on the smaller size would you root wash and trim roots when it needs to be repotted yes yes because <laughs> it's in the pot even if you planted it perfectly the first time with your roots going out like the spokes of a wheel it eventually is going to start circling because it's in the pot. Okay. And when it gets to the point where it starts to sort of decline a little bit, 
because it's all pot bound, then it's time to pop it out of the pot, wash all the planting medium off, trim those roots and plant it in fresh potting soil again. Maybe Basically, even you're a just, slightly different pot. You're just actually bonsaiing it. You're yeah. controlling the growth, the growth of the roots and on the top. Right. Yeah. I think everybody's very excited to root wash everything. Uh, the, the one downside about root washing is that it's best done in the fall when it's cold and miserable outside. And so you're going to be out there with a the hose and you're going to be wet and you're going to be cold and you're going to think, why am I doing this? But you're going to have such good results for your plants. It's going to be worth it. So persevere. <laughs>